Tiger Loud, Tiger Loud and had one simple message. Sam Armitage needs to apologise to our people. Live on air, the Seven Network Sunrise program was drowned out by a chorus of Indigenous protesters demanding the breakfast show say sorry for a controversial segment on Aboriginal children. Hello, I'm Paul Barry. Welcome to Media Watch. And more trouble for Seven Sunrise on Tuesday when its live broadcast from Broadbeach was blitzed by angry protesters. And in case you've forgotten what enraged them, it was this ill-informed pronouncement on Aboriginal child welfare on the program last month. Just like the first Dolan generation where a lot of children were taken because it was for their well-being, we need to do it again, perhaps. Yeah. Shortly after that discussion went to air, there were rowdy protests outside Sunrise's glass-fronted studio in Sydney's Martin Place. The show's producers were able to blank them out by running a recorded backdrop. But last week on the Gold Coast Dunes, live for the Commonwealth Games, there was nowhere to hide. Yeah, some of the language leaves a lot to be desired and I grew up in the sheep yard. By all reports, some of the language was vile, as Sam's friend Alan Jones told listeners next day. Some of the louder protesters called Sam a C, a racist effing pig and a white bitch. It was indeed nasty stuff. So, what was Seven to do? Simple, really. Just play it again, Sam. With protests raging as the 7.30 bulletin loomed, Sunrise opted to rerun the 6.30 news they'd broadcast one hour earlier. Leading the news today, of course, our Aussies have dominated the competition once again at the Commonwealth Games. And with protests still running at 8am, they repeated the trick with their 7 o'clock banter. That's three, two second, third. And thank you to that man who was sitting next to me who didn't know who gave me a glass of wine. Oh, no. He's so friendly, this guy. Why would he do that? I just thought he needed one. He swiped right with the wine. <laughs> Luckily, there was no actual news to break. Meanwhile, the hosts sought out quieter spots on the beach to introduce pre-recorded packages. Until finally, almost an hour after the chance began, Koshi acknowledged the protesting mob. Happy for people to protest, as long as it's done in an orderly way and make your point on the protest. Here is against land rights and, and genocide. But that, of course, was not all, or even most, of what the protests were about, as one of them made clear. And all we are asking is for Samantha Armitage to come out and apologise for the comments and the guests that she had invited. Not much chance of Sam doing that, although Sunrise did try to make amends two weeks ago by having a proper debate on how to tackle Indigenous child abuse. So, on Friday, with warnings from police of further, more dangerous protests, Sunrise moved down the coast to a different secret venue. And the protesters ended up in Broadbeach Mall instead, where five were arrested. So, where will it end? Who knows? But with the show back in the studio this week, where it's easier to blank out the protests, Seven will almost certainly try to tough it out. But now, to the expensive legal battle between Geoffrey Rush and News Corp over this front page shaming in The Telegraph last November. King Lear, world exclusive. That screaming headline and this double page spread inside, stars barred behaviour, accused the Oscar-winning actor of sexually harassing a young actress during the STC's production of the Shakespeare play, alleging he touched her inappropriately on stage. Since then, the fallout's been dramatic for all concerned, including Geoffrey Rush, whose lawyers last week filed an affidavit detailing the damage to his health and career. The movie star has been virtually housebound, is full of anxiety whenever in public and is taking medication. He also suffers from lack of sleep, barely eats and believes his worth to the theatre and film industry is now irreparably damaged. The stage now looks set for News Corp to pay massive damages if it loses. And so far that case is not going well. Because last month the judge disallowed The Telegraph's best defence, that its allegations about Rush were true. Justice Michael Wigney said The Telegraph's justifications for how its story is true were plainly deficient. What part of Mr Rush relevantly touched the actress? Was it one or both of his hands or some other part of his body? And what part of the actress's body was touched? What was the nature and duration of the touch? So vague and imprecise, said the judge, that the Oscar winner could not reasonably know what allegations he was required to defend. The Telegraph's attempt to subpoena a crucial Sydney Theatre Company investigation into the complaint was also knocked back by the judge, who accused the telly of mounting a fishing expedition in the hope of finding something in support of its plea. 
So, with the alleged victim refusing to help, the telly's chances have not been looking good. But today, it rolled the dice again and came back to court for permission to sue the Sydney Theatre Company on the grounds that the STC was partly responsible for its story. And in doing so, although the telly vehemently denies it, the paper appears to have broken its own code of conduct by outing one of its confidential sources, the STC's executive director, Patrick McIntyre. According to the telly's claim, McIntyre told gossip columnist Jonathan Moran, the STC had vowed never to work with Rush again. But he only told the journalist on condition the statement was not attributed to him, which Rush's counsel told the federal court meant... Do not name me. Do not use my name, mate. I am confidential. So why did the telly turn on him? Well, if its cross-claim against the STC is allowed, the theatre company could be forced to pay a share of any damages. But, more importantly, it could also be forced to hand over its investigation of the complaint against Rush, which might allow news to reinstate its key truth defence. So, tactically clever but strategically potentially disastrous, as Russia's counsel told the court. So what News Limited is saying, and this is a novel claim, that when it rings a person and asks for information to help it publish a story, it's appropriate to sue that person for complying with that request? Yes, not a good message to send out to informants, especially when they fear your solemn promise not to name them may be worth nothing. Back in 2016, after the Australian's Chris Mitchell betrayed several ancient confidences in his memoir, News Corp's boss, Michael Miller, sent a stern email to his editors to remind them they should never do the same. Those who deal with us and work for us need to know that ours is a company with a long history of valuing trust and confidences. And this remains constant today. We know and respect that private conversations and confidences will remain just that private and confidential. Trust is core to our company's reputation and the reputation of each of our mastheads. As Miller pointed out, News Corp's own code requires that confidential sources be protected, as does the Code of Ethics for the Journalists' Union. And if those codes are broken, why would anyone trust the telly again? As defamation lawyer Matthew Collins QC told me to watch... Sources are the lifeblood of the news media, particularly in investigative journalism. Sources speak to the media because they rightly assume, or are assured, that they will be protected. So, was it worth the risk? Well, it's unclear, because despite the court sitting today, the judge is yet to decide if the Telegraph can pursue the Sydney Theatre Company in the way it wants. And in other defamation news, Rebel Wilson was last week awarded more than $1 million in costs against Bauer Media to add to her record $4.5 million in damages, which she won for stories judged to be a pack of lies in Woman's Day, who have excelled themselves again with this story that Jennifer Aniston and Brad Pitt are back on again. And wait for it. Yes, Jen's pregnant. Yes, pregnant again. And how do we know? Because of the bump. Except that Jen's still childless, despite having been, quote, pregnant in the mags, scores of times before. And twice already with that very same bump. Back in 2013, when the pictures were taken. And then again last year. Pathetic, isn't it? And deceitful. But alas, Women's Day is not alone. Two weeks ago, New Idea had Jen meeting Brad's kids. Shiloh's plea to Jen. Can I call you mummy? And that story is far more of a cheat, because the photo isn't even real. It's made up of this one from London in 2016, where Brad was out with his family, and this one of Jen alone in New York six months later, merged together into one. Touching, isn't it? Now, making stuff up is hardly new to women's magazines, but faking photographs is a whole new level of fraud, yet it's now becoming commonplace. Take this picture, for example. Brad and Jen. Why we can't hide our love anymore. That ran in Woman's Day, New Idea and NW a couple of weeks ago. And it looks real enough. But Brad is actually kissing Angelina Jolie on a movie set in Budapest eight years ago. While Jen is kissing her co-star, Jason Bateman, on set in 2009. And claims of the couple being back together are just a blatant lie. As is NW's recent revelation with this cover shot. 
that Brad and Jen were, quote, finally free to go public because, again, surprise, surprise, the two weren't together at all. Brad was holding Angelina's hand at Airlie Beach on a trip down under in 2014, while Jen was holding husband Justin's hand and uh, hmm, a paper bag three years later, until magic brought them together. The previous month, NW had Jen bonding with Brad's son Knox, and that was fake as well. Jen was in fact bonding with her child co-star back in 2009, while Knox was out with his dad, mum and sister six years later, in a grey jumper that's been turned blue. So, do the mags know what they're doing? Of course they do. It's deliberate deceit, breaching every rule of journalism. So we asked the editors of these magazines, Fiona Connolly, Francis Sheen and Mark Brandon, why they were lying to their readers. We're sorry to say they have not replied. So we're assuming they admit they are guilty. And finally, to some important medical news from Nine's Today Show. Sick Australians in desperate need of medicinal cannabis may soon be able to get their hands on the drug much faster. Well, it's not yet news. It's more someone saying that it ought to happen. So, what exactly is today's medical guru, Dr Ross Walker, proposing? Well, they're proposing that uh, if you need medical cannabis based on a doctor's decision, you can get now medical cannabis within 48 hours. But there's a problem. The problem is it still costs you $1,500 a month. And, Carl, you tell me anyone who can afford $1,500 a month, uh, especially when they're sick. Good point from a doctor whose patients could really benefit. But Dr Walker is no ordinary doctor. He's a life coach, speaker, author and popular media personality and an advocate, as you may remember, for alternative medicines. <laughs> Are there natural oh, options that people can use to lower blood uh, pressure? Ab absolutely. Some, something that I find really very useful is the, this thing called chiolic aged garlic extract. Oh, right. And as it turns out, he's also a big fan of medical marijuana. Indeed, Dr Walker is on the board of the Medical Cannabis Council, which describes itself as the respected voice of this burgeoning industry. And he believes cannabis can help the sick and the government should help pay for it. So what are you proposing? What do you think? Well, I think, I think the, the evidence there is good. It's, it's not uh, hardcore evidence, but it's still good enough for the sickest of the sick. So I think the government should be subsidising. Getting taxpayers to foot the bill for medicinal cannabis is the aim of the industry council that Walker sits on. But it would also bring a huge financial windfall for companies like MGC Pharma, which is set up to produce and supply cannabis-based products in Australia and elsewhere. So who is that? smiling from behind the boardroom table. Yes, it's Dr Walker, who, as you can see from the annual report, was paid $213,640 by MGC Pharma last year in salary, bonus and shares for being its non-executive director. Dr Walker's also in line to receive 4 million shares in the company, whose value could skyrocket if medicinal cannabis were to become cheap and readily available. So I think the government should be subsidising it. I just don't know anyone who could afford $1,500 a month for this. Doctor, thank you. So why did today not tell us he's a lobbyist for the industry and has a big financial stake in the drug he's pushing? Channel 9 told me to watch it was... A production failure. Steps have been taken to ensure it is not repeated. And what about the doctor? Ross Walker says he did tell Channel 9... And claim to Media Watch. I have and will never intentionally neglect to disclose any financial relationships I have with any company as I would see this as being unethical. Channel 9's inability to mention my involvement with these companies was purely their fault. Ah, so he was not responsible at all. Personally, I find that attitude a bit hard to accept. If you push a product, you tell the public where you're coming from. It's your duty too. And there's more about tonight's stories on our Facebook page or our website where you can get a transcript, download the program and see statements from Seven, Nine and Ross Walker. You can also catch up with us on iView and contact me or MediaWatch on Twitter. And don't forget, Media Bites every Thursday. But for now, until next week, that's it from us. Goodbye. Goodbye.